Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining the TCTAP virtual section this year. We are now having the case section for complex BCI presentation and global partners. In these sections, I would like to introduce my co-chairman, Dr. Chao uh, <laughs> Chiao from, from Taipei. We have a group of three very distinguished panelists. They are Dr. Choi Jae Woon, Dr. Kentaro Jujo, and Dr. Pianat, uh, Pianot. And we are going to have six presenters. Each of them will present for six minutes, and then we have a four minute discussion. So without further ado, may I introduce our first presenters, Dr. Kunai Bikram Shaha. Uh, he's going to present to us a blend of conventional and non-conventional approach during primary PCI of a daunting acute inferior wall myocardial infarction, a short story. So our first presenter, please. First of all, uh, uh, I'd like to thank TCTAP Forum for having given me an opportunity to present uh, on this prestigious for, uh, forum. So today's, uh, my talk is, uh, presentation is confined to a short story of a daunting acute inferior wall MI. Uh, I am Dr. Kunal Vikram Shah, working as an interventional cardiologist at Patan Academy of Health Sciences and Bayada Hospitals in Nepal. Uh, so let's proceed with my presentation, which comprises of a short story which talks on blend of conventional and non-conventional approach during primary PCI, PCI of a daunting acute inferior wall MI. There are no any financial disclosures uh, to be made pertaining to this presentation or procedure, though as per standard norms, I have mentioned the names of the companies uh, of the hardware. My patient, 45-year-old heavy smoker, presented in OR with a severe central chest pain of 30 minutes duration associated with nausea and vomiting. His pulse was regular, the 54 beats per minute, and his blood pressure was 100 by 17 millimeters of mercury, and he was maintaining room air uh, SpO2 at room air, which was around 98%. We see a serious exam revealed first and second heart sound without any added sounds. His chest exam was normal. There were no any accompanying arrhythmias. This was the ECG taken at the uh, time of presentation where it showed chest elevation in inferior lead and even in V5 and V6. But uh, the chest elevation in three being two made us think about the possibility of RCA as a culprit artery. This echo screening revealed hypokinetic mid basal inferior wall and lateral wall with EF of 40 to 45 percent, no any MR were noted. CKMB surprisingly was eight unit and quantitative troponin was negative because uh, maybe the patient presented in very early hours within 30 minutes. So we directly took the patient to the cath lab and uh, coronary angiogram was performed via the right radial approach using six French C, the right system as you can see here revealed 100% thrombotic occlusion of distal RCA with slow flow and partial thrombus-laden lumen commencing from the mid-RCA. Similarly, uh, left system angiograms showed uh, normal left main with mild disease in LED, and there were 70 to 80% stenosis in distal LCX with some slow flow. So uh, right away, uh, uh, we started the PCI uh, thinking RCA as a culprit artery. So as you can see, uh, uh, with a six foot uh, radial seat uh, by a right radial artery, we hooked up the, uh, the RCA osteum with GR 3.5 and a BMW wire was tried first, but it could not traverse the distal RCA. Even with the two wire technique, then anyhow, we were able to cross the lesion with a choice PT, uh, 0.014 uh, uh, wire that helps us cross the lesion. Then we started as a uh, routine procedure, the uh, pre-dilatation with balloon angioplasty using uh, NC quantum 2012, but uh, we could not see any uh, flow yet. Similarly, then we thought of uh, 
doing a thrombosuction and we did it repeatedly for two, three times, but still the result was futile. And this was time uh, mm. when I was really worried whether I could save this patient or not. Then suddenly uh, it came, an idea came into my mind of divide and rule. That is divide for, that is disintegrate the clot and rule with the thrombosuction. So what I we did was uh, we uh, had a noble idea of giving intracoronary streptokinase one third of the total uh, dose uh, directly uh, into the coron right coronary and we waited for 10, uh, 20 minutes and then started the thrombosuction again. With that, we could uh, get some flow. So I start, uh, kept on continuing thrombosuction for almost 10 times with Thrombuster 2 from Kaneka Japan. And meanwhile, what I did, uh, did was uh, we kept on infusing one million units via the peripheral line. And the result was fabulous. You can see here the amount of thrombus here in the filter. And this was the immediate result. And this was the result after three months of the check NGO, where we can see there was initially there was TIMI2 flow. And three months back, we had a TIMI. Uh, three floors. Since the RCA was ecstatic with good vessel size discrepancy and large thrombus burden was there, we stenting was deferred and we combined both conventional and non-conventional approach to, uh, approaches to achieve at least TIMI2 flow. The hospital course was une uneventful with EF in, uh, improved from 40 to 45% to 50 to 55% with residual hyperkinesia based on interval, but there were no any excess site or non-excess site bleeding complications. Three months after uh, we saw there were no any regional wall motion or normality with well-preserved EF of 60% and mild CAD was uh, left over in the check angiogram as you had seen before. So coming on to the discussion, actually this is an illustration of a bailout procedure. We thought uh, we had to come up with some new idea because the right coronary was not opening at all. We thought of infusing one third of, one third of thrombolytic intracoronary and we had radial access in our hand. So we are not much worried about the excess site bleeding complications. And we started thrombosuction again after 20 minutes so that uh, thrombolytic can help disintegrate the clot and which can enable thrombosuction uh, to work. Later, we gave full dose of thrombolytic intravenously so that clot disintegration and dissolution continues while working on with the thrombosuction for 10 times, which finally yielded us intracoronary clot. So my take home message on this, uh, the, this work is purely derivative of a dictum that need is mother of in invention. So there was a dire need of opening of the right coronary artery. Though thrombosuction alone has no mortality benefit yet, and it's class 2B indication, but thrombosuction in a lysis artery can be a new pharmacoinvasive strategy to deal with a better outcome in case of large thrombus burden, where there is a high potential of distal microembolization in cases of ACS. So maybe we can open up new doors with thrombolytic in conjuncture with thrombosuction as an armory of primary PCI. So the, with this uh, final uh, say, I'd like you to thank for giving me an opportunity uh, to present my case on this PCTAP forum. Thank you from the land of Everest, Nepal. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shaha, for presenting to us an excellent case, really a daunting task. Do we have any comment from our group of panelists? You can voice out your comment to unmute yourself and then voice out your comment. Okay, yes, this me? is... Uh... Um, okay. Go ahead. You first, you first. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. So I'm Dr. Zizia from Tokyo. I'm an uh, interventional cardiologist. I'm actually 20 years uh, medical doctor. So um, my question one is, uh, um, you showed the uh, echocardiogram is very unique because, uh, you know, the, there was no mirror image in the um, uh, other, you know, uh, other uh, uh, section. So, um, of course, the inferior uh, wall, uh, uh, the two, three, and AVL uh, uh, is uh, obviously uh, elevated. 
but no acid, acid drop in other parts. So do you have any uh, possible reason for explaining the, the phenomenon? You mean to say there were no, no any reciprocal changes in the- Oh yes, that's right, yeah. Uh, possibly the occlusion was distal. The area confined was very small, but mm -hmm. the only we were worried about was the arrhythmia that it may bring. Okay, so but it it obviously affected the um the LV uh systolic uh, motion. So um I don't think that the infarction area is not so small. So my question number two is um uh you uh uh the um uh, thrombus uh, uh break by the you know larger balloon inflation because uh if there is uh, no straight one straight line to this part, maybe a uh, slumbleitis, a slumbleitic uh, uh, method is not working very well. So do you have any idea? Sorry, pardon, I could not get you. I mean, I mean, so um, if uh, the thrombus is uh, still there as a, you know, huge uh, mass, uh, if, even if you inject the thrombolytic no, but agent. After the thrombolytic, uh, we have done the thrombosuction, repeated thrombosuction. Mm -hmm. We infused okay. the uh, thrombolytic, we waited for 20 minutes, and I think somehow there was disintegration in the thrombus burden, and it helped the, uh, to aspirate that chunk. So you okay. actually broke the thrombus first. Yeah. And then, okay. Thanks. Well, maybe one more very quick question from our panelists. Actually, there is no question for me, and uh, I would like to uh, congratulate for the case. And uh, I think it is a brilliant idea giving the patients intra-original thrombolysis. I've never had any uh, experience with the streptokinase intra-coronary. <laughs> uh, I, I used to use the Altiplase, the small dose. Okay. The um, the the effect of it uh, sometimes is unpredictable, but I believe mm. most of the time it, it is helpful, uh, particularly in, in patient who is, in a, like in this patient, he, he is young, so we don't have to give more concern over the bleeding problem. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe there is no bleeding at all. Okay. And I agree that the, the, the stenting yes, might not be necessary for this patient, mm. I agree. The next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Pio Wong. He's going to talk about a case uh, stent embolization caused by a CPR machine. Okay, Dr. Pio Wong, please. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Pio Wong from Burilam Hospital. My case is stent embolization caused by automated CPR machine. I have no conflict of interest. The case is 45 years old woman. She has a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma of cervix stage 2B and currently on palliative chemotherapy. She had chest pain at rest for one hour, ready to left arm, and came to emergency room. The EKG showed isolated posterior wall STEMI. At emergency room, she was loading with aspirin and clopidogrel and sent to cat lab for primary PCI. Right coronary angiogram is good flow. For the left coronary angiogram, the circumflexal slow flow, TM1 flow with massive thrombus burden. The thrombus is continued along circumflex and left main. At that time, I start PCI with the sequence system, use the backup guiding wire to the circumflex and uh, try to aspiration from guiding, but no thrombus obtained. We use the thrombectomy catheter multiple attempts to, to aspirate it, but no thrombus obtained too. So we decided to, to balloon, to open some flow to circumflex, but there was the risk of the thrombus shift to the LAD. So we wire the LAD first. In case of the thrombus shift, we can aspirate it from LAD. We use TO balloon at nominal pressure to open the flow, 
But after we, we balloon, LED was slow, so we put the thrombectomy in, but no thrombus obtained. We give the RTPA 5 milligram by guiding. Suddenly, the patient developed cardiac arrest, her systolic blood pressure was dropped, she was lost of consciousness. The patient was intubated, start CPR, PAA operation. At that time, we made CPR anti-rot, then continue revascularization. But fortunately, we have the automated CPR machine at our cat lab. So we can do the CPR and PCI at the same time. We plan change, change the system to seven frames. We plan to do the step class YLAD and circumflex and give the second dose of RTPA. And this is the crime scene. We put the Y in circumflex, YLAD, and put the 3 O stand in LAD. Put the 3 O balloon to circumflex for crushing stand. We position the LAD stand to cross left main and LAD. It's very difficult to position the stand because of excessive motion due to the machine. Finally, we deploy the LED stand and crush LED stand with the balloon. Then put another stand, 3O stand to the concrete. Deploy the stand and pot the left main with NC40 at 18 atmosphere. And this is the final angiogram. The autopause time was 40 minutes. We do it three times defibrillation, 11 amp of adrenaline was given. Intraatic balloon pump was pressed after the procedure and sent her to CCU. After the patent was sent to CCU, I reviewed the angiogram, but it showed that the stand at LED was embolized from proximal LED to mid LED, and we cannot file the circumflex stent. At day three, the pattern can off balloon pump and can off endotracheal tube on day four, but she cannot continue anticoagulant due to vaginal bleeding from cancer. She got only do our antiplatelet therapy and re CAT after two weeks. The CAT show good flow to LAD and circumflex. We do the IWAS guide stand optimization of the LAD stand and do the whole body scan to, to identify where the loss stand, but we cannot file it. According to algorithm of the Euro PCR, if stand loss in aorta or peripheral artery and cannot identify by proscopy, they suggest to do the supraesthetic CT scan, but we cannot do in this case because the pattern is very unstable. The patient was discharged from hospital, laying off stay for 15 days, and continued palliative care for CA service. No evidence of stroke or recurrent MI during for up and she died from instead CA service seven months later. Take home message, intercoronary fibrinolysis can use as bailout medication in massive thrombus burden. Automatic CPR machine is helpful for PCI during cardiac arrest, but PCI with automatic CPR machine can use only in limited view and limited time, actually it's battery time. Operator should temporarily stop the machine before pressing stent, and mechanical force of the machine can push the deployed stent to improper position, especially when used under size stent. In this case, maybe some discussion points if we can go back, can we use different strategies? Or anyone can share tips and tricks to perform PCI with automated CPI machine. Thank you for your attention. Yes, this is a very interesting case uh, presented by the Pyong. And uh, I have a question. Uh, instead of use the automatic CPI machine uh, and doing the rest of the PCI procedure, did you consider use the ECMO, the VA yes. ECMO? Yeah, and the most uh, modern uh, uh, modality uh, we adopt in the uh, uh, cat lab, uh, actually not very rare. So especially for this uh, uh, cardiac rest case, and uh, I think the ECMO is another uh, option, but 
Uh, you save the case uh, uh, immediately during the, uh, the catastrophe of the, of the uh, PCI procedure due to the uh, thrombus migration and the and the, and the uh, hard of uh, keep the uh, with the coronary flow. Uh, but uh, I still want the opinion from the other panelists. Any uh, comment from the panelists? Uh, in angiography, the coronary region may be minimal, minimal, minimal region. The, however, the massive thrombosis occurred uh, in, in patient. What is the cause of uh, thrombosis? It may, it may, does it make uh, may the related with the uh, uh, underlying carcinoma or any other reason? And uh, even though the thrombotomy, thrombus aspiration was first uh, tried, uh, it may fail. What is the cause of the aspiration failure? Yes, yes, I, I agree with you because the the arteries of the patient they look somewhat healthy, and yeah. I'm thinking about the the cause of the uh, the thromb thrombosis might not be the, the plaque rupture, any uh, any possibility that the cause or the source of the thrombus could be from others. For example, patient may have had the the deviant thrombosis. She may have the um, PFO or the right yeah. lip shunt somewhere, and the, the thrombus just cross over to the left side. Just, a, mm. just an embolized thrombus, not the plaque rupture related. And even even he lost the stent, the circumflex stent, the arteries still look <laughs> like normal. Doesn't yeah. look like there is any disease anymore. So yeah. I'm thinking about the, the cause of the thrombosis might not be the, the, the ruptured blood, could be embolized thrombus from somewhere. Okay, it's very hard to uh, <clears throat> hard to know. Okay, uh, during this uh, very uh, uh, urgent condition, and uh, but the, based on my personal experience, I, I most of the time the the thrombosis is fail most of the time, and I use uh, quite a uh, a, a, a handful of cases use this IC urocanus uh, to dissolve the uh, thrombus uh, uh, quite effectively. And the, uh, uh, because of the time limitation, I think I will have moved to the, the, the third presenter, okay? Dr. Chen. Okay, yeah. May I introduce our next uh, presenter, Dr. Manny, coming from India. Dr. Manny is going to share with us a complex specific anonymous white corner artery PCI with road ablation. Dr. Mani, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Mani, working in NH Group Hospital in Kolkata, India. So uh, this is a case of a complex calcific anomalous RCA PCI with road ablation. My patient was a 68-year-old female non-diabetic normotensive having an inferior wall MI one month back when she was conservatively treated. And now she presents with a post-infarct angina and shortness of breath. She is clinically very frail and her echo shows a hypokinetic inferior posterior wall with an ejection fraction of 40% and some mitral annular calcification. The catheterization showed a normal LMCA. LAD was large caliber with some trump track calcification, but it, there was no significant critical stenosis and LCX was non-dominant and more or less free. But RCA, as you can see, is a high anomalous, high posterior origin, slightly anomalous origin with a sharp brain bend at the proximal part, which uh, you can see in some of the images, not in all images. And this has a long segment calcification starting from proximal to distal. And the mid part has a very critical almost 90% stenosis as you can see in the lateral image. So we started with worrying through the normal dark horse war with a run through intermediate. There was some difficulty in worrying, uh, but somehow we manage our war into the distal vascular bed. And then we uh, had the plan of rota ablation. So we had to exchange the rota wire. So we introduced the micro catheter and we exchanged our uh, run through wire over the, uh, with the rota wire. And uh, when we tried to introduce a 1.5 rota link plus rota bar, you can see that the catheter is backing out and we were unable to 
in enter even into the proximal part of our RCA. That was probably because of lack of coaxiality. There was a sharp bend in the proximal RCA, and there was gross intimal calcification, which you can so, show later in the imaging. So these were the probable reasons. So we had to do something because we were unable to introduce the uh, rota uh, bar. So we had to deep engage the guide cat for which we introduced the NC balloon into the mid RCA. We slightly inflated and while deflating the balloon, we pushed our guide cat, normal uh, GR guide cat over the uh, deflating balloon. So this is a technique to suck in the catheter up to as much as possible into the mid prox mid junction of the RCA. And thus now we could uh, introduce the rota bar, but that was also just up to the proximal RCA. We were not succeeding to introduce it any further. So we had to be happy with this much introduction of the rota bar and we had to proceed. So first we uh, confirmed the coaxiality of the rota bar because that is most important. It can par perforate the artery if it is not coaxial. So in three different or orthogonal views, we confirmed the coaxiality. And then uh, suddenly the patient started developing bradycardia. We had to position the temporary pacemaker and then we started our uh, barring. So uh, from the first instance, we, we tried to bar it almost up to the proximal PDA. We crossed the crux and went up to the proximal PDA because we don't know whether we could trap it or we can introduce it any further. So immediately there was slow, slow flow, particularly because the catheter was deeply engaged and there was complete heart block with extreme ST elevation. The patient went into arrest. We started CPR and we stabilized the patient. And this is the image just after stabilization. So you can see that uh, there was not uh, too much optimal uh, predilatation. We did an OCT run then. Uh, from the distal uh, RC and this is the OCT run. So as we proceed from, we retreat from distal RCA to proximal RCA, you will be able to see that there are a lot of calcification, medial as well as intimal calcification, particularly in the proximate segments. And with the uh, rota, we we had successfully cracked most of the calcium, particularly in the mid part, and we had uh, created some space uh, for our stents or further balloons to expand. So as we are proceeding, we are now in mid RCA. You can see that there are chunks of calcium, uh, uh, much more than 0.5 millimeter depth and uh, the length you have already seen in the angiographic images. So just due to shortage of time, I'm running a little bit fast. So this is the area as you can see, I have, we have cracked the calcium as much as possible. And then we did serial pre-dilatations with 2.5 millimeter balloon all through the RCA. We were not over aggressively dilating. So um, we took the help of a guidezilla. That is the slide I skipped because we were unable to negotiate the stent into the proximal, uh, in, into the RCA. So we had to take the help of a guidezilla. We had to introduce the guidezilla up to the mid RCA. And then we took a 2.75 into 40 millimeter biomine stent and uh, up to the mid, uh, mid part of the PDA, we deployed our first stent and that was at nominal pressure. And then we dilated the mid part of the RCA with that stent balloon, 2.75 stent balloon, uh, and introduced our next stent, which was a long tapered stent. It had a three millimeter diameter in the distal part and 3.5 millimeter in the proximal part. And it was a long stent, 60 millimeter. And this we deployed at high pressure of 20 atmosphere. Then again, it was difficult to push in our uh, post dilatation balloon. So again, we had to take the help of guidezilla. As you can see, we had to introduce the guidezilla even within the proximal stent. And then only we can push our balloon up to the overlap segment and we could post dilate. So there were serial post dilatations with 3.5 millimeter balloons. And uh, then uh, for pushing in the final imaging catheter, OCT catheter, again, we had to take the help of a guidezilla because we were unable to introduce it anyway. And final OCT run, I will show you. Uh, this is the final angiographic images, which is looking more or less satisfactory uh, in both the views. And we had not done any complications. And this is the final diameters we have achieved. Uh, it is a 5.5 centimeter MLA in the distal RCA and 8.72 square millimeter in the proximal RCA. And uh, it shows that uh, the stent was more or less properly expanded and well opposed. And it was, uh, it was, uh, there was no residual significant stenosis. 
so the take home message is during root ablation of tca it has extreme care should be taken for proper orientation and coaxiality with respect to vessel lumen due care should be taken regarding post rota vessel optimization because there was so much difficulty in pushing the balloon pushing in the stent even after uh, pre dilating with a 2.5 mm guide zilla is an extremely useful tool for pushing such uh, imaging catheters or balloons and particularly stent when it is not deliverable in a non compliant vessel and stenting should be followed by care full post dilatation with final intravascular imaging routinely to confirm adequate stent deployment i don't have any disclosures thank you thank you uh, dr thank, mani yeah thank you very much uh, dr mani very challenging cases any comment well yes dr mani you know the use of a uh, guideliner or guideliner can also help you during the initial road ablation since it's a femoral approach you can use a bigger size guide or seven french Guideliner, guideliner should you know help you a lot during the very first stage of the rotor ablation. I I saw you got a lot of difficulty in during the first part of the uh, rotor ablation. Maybe you can try all these guideliner and guideliner earlier on while they're uh, reserving for the latter part. But I have a very short a comment for this very short uh, uh, heavy classification lesion. You, you can uh, use the uh, uh, scoring balloon tube. Now there's uh, several type of scoring balloon uh, available. Uh, so uh, the uh, most frequently used one is uh, angioscope. Angioscope has a uh, three uh, in the titanic uh, metallic wire, and it's most strong uh, scoring balloon than uh, the others. So, uh, but uh, uh, from the uh, OCT, I see the classification is now. 36 uh, uh, degrees of uh, circumferential classification. So let's land uh, to 270. You can you can use a scoring button to make it everything easier. But I really, I really appreciate you are uh, this uh, tapping uh, uh, biomimi uh, morphy uh, long uh, stand. And uh, also, I it's very impressive uh, about you use a Godzilla in 2D stand. Most of the time, we are we are afraid to damage the stand uh, still structure. But uh, from the uh, uh, final OCT uh, checkup, it seems uh, this uh, biomimi stand is uh, very good. It's an uh, India project. It's, it's good. Thank it's you, sir. Uh, there's no more comment. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manny, for your excellent mm -hmm. presentation. May Dr. Chow introduce our next uh, speaker? Yes, the next presenter is uh, the first one is Dr. Osama Shapi from uh, Egypt. The uh, topic will be the uh, transradial carotid artery standing, complicated with neck hematoma. Uh, it's a very interesting case. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Osama. Thank you very much. My case for today is a, a, a transradial carotid artery standing that complicated with the neck hematoma. My name is Osama Shoaib. I am from uh, Egypt. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, uh, my case is a male patient, 56 years old, He's diabetic hypertensive. He has a previous history of uh, 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 multiple stenting uh, for his coronary. Uh, our patient experienced an attack of transient ischemic attack uh, three weeks ago. Uh, his carotid doubler uh, confirmed the presence of right carotid artery stenosis. Uh, also, uh, the stenosis was confirming using a CT scan. Uh, our patient was discussed in our heart team meeting and we decided for a coronary artery stenting, giving the high cardiovascular risk uh, for such patient if he uh, went for uh, carotid artery uh, and arterectomy. Uh, and also we uh, decided for a carotid artery stenting using the uh, right radial axis, especially given that our patient has a peripheral arterial disease. So uh, we chosen the uh, right radial axis uh, after the regular sex French cheese, uh, uh, a Jotkin Wright diagnostic catheter was introduced into the common carotid artery. Then a tromo stiff wire was advanced toward the external carotid artery, and then we exchanged it for a long uh, cheese. Then using our uh, BM wire, we started to ne negotiate the uh, internal carotid artery uh, stenosis, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> Then we advanced our spider FX filter distally to the internal carotid artery. And then we started to deploy our uh, Borti J uh, RX stent uh, into place using the bony landmark. 
Afterwards, we went for both dilatation using the 5.0 uh, balloon. Then we withdraw our filter and we have a very good final angiographic result. So we transferred our patient to our coronary care unit. And within two hours, our patient started to uh, describe some neck pain without nothing visible uh, by uh, local examination. So we decided to have a, a rapid ultrasound scan. Our ultrasound scan revealed the presence of uh, 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 some uh, uh, fluid collection around the patient's sternomastoid uh, muscles. So we went immediately to revise our uh, angiogram and we found that from one of our views, we have a very small perforation in one of the distal external carotid artery branches. It may be happened with the, during the negotiation with the uh, trumo stiff wire while we was exchanging the uh, diagnostic catheter with the long, with our uh, 19 centimeter long uh, sheath. Here is a still image uh, uh, showing clearly the perforation uh, of the uh, distal end of the uh, small, our small branches. So we went for uh, some uh, literature review and we found that uh, in most of the literature uh, the described uh, cases like this, uh, we uh, all the literature uh, uh, using coiling and obstruction for uh, the uh, uh, perforated artery when it's especially the external carotid itself or one of uh, its largest branch. So we decided to go for such conservative management and we did a two hour follow up ultrasound examination every two hours that confirmed that the fluid collection is stationary, not increasing and patient symptoms was stationary also. And here is our uh, uh, ultrasound examination after 24 hours show the complete resolution of the fluid around the patient sternomastoid uh, muscle and patient was discharged home safely. My main discussion point is the uh, uh, radial artery versus femoral artery, especially in the carotid artery stenting. It shows no difference in the vascular complication, but it has a shorter duration of hospitalization. Also, neck hematoma and uh, uh, arterial perforation uh, may need uh, embolization, and uh, everyone working with carotid artery stenting should always be uh, ready. And my take home message is to always use the Tromo stiff wire uh, under the guidance of the uh, roadmap, or you can try to uh, uh, utilize a traumatic tip wire such as the control wire. And if the perforation happen, the operator should be familiar with the embolization and the uh, safety measures to uh, uh, rescue the patient in such a situation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osama. Uh, this is a very, <laughs> very lucky case, you know, uh, for the uh, carotid dissection and the perforation. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a it's a mortal case. And uh, uh, I never use a radio approach for carotid stenting because the angulation, not just the wire you use because the uh, the guider angulation may be cause very easy to cause that section. So uh, I would just ask, uh, would you do the uh, just radio next time for color standing? <laughs> because traditional is from uh, a transfemoral. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, safe and easier, you know. Well, just for this patient, the patient has a peripheral arterial disease that uh, made that uh, uh, was an ob obligation to try for the, uh, the radial access. That just the patient has uh, multiple trials for previous PCIs, all were transfemoral approach. So we have some, uh, he have uh, some uh, stenosis uh, for, for his, for post femoral arteries. So the choice of the radial artery was just an obligation for us just for the clinical scenario of the patient. I will solve the uh, peripheral artery <laughs> first, then the do the attention yeah. color to the stenting, okay? <laughs> because you have to fix the, uh, the bilateral uh, femoral artery too. Okay. Well, Dr. Osama may be- Can you come from panelist? Yeah. Dr. Osama may be a very short question. Do you protect the airway? Do you intubate the patient because there's a risk of uh, the hematoma compressing on the airway? Are you worried about that? 
Yes, that's our main concern was to have any uh, airway obstruction caused by this hematoma. But we was fortunate that this was very small and we checked it every two hours and we were concerned about this and we were ready. But uh, during the giving the small size of the hematoma, giving its uh, constant size, uh, it's even it was not visible over the uh, the neck of the uh, of the patient at that time. Uh, so we it went. We were fortunate. Yeah. Thank I have you. a very short question. Do you use the protamine to reverse the anticoagulant uh, effect? Protamine. Yes, Protamine, yes we did. Yeah. You do? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go to the next case. Yes, Please. okay. Well, maybe I would like to introduce our next presenter coming from National Heart Institute of Malaysia, Dr. Tay. Uh, Dr. Tay is going to share with us drug coated balloon of native osteo LAD. Dr. Tay, please. Yeah. yeah, hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, panelists and other presenters. I'm Dave from Malaysia. Uh, I'm going to present a case, a drug with a balloon of the native posterior left injury descending arteries. So I have no potential conflicts of interest to declare. So this is a 67 years old gentleman with underlying coronary artery disease with uh, angioplasty performed in 2009. He has a 2 DS10 in the proximal to mid LAD and overlap with each other, as well as another stand in the left uh, circumflex. Other cardiovascular risk factors include hypertension and dyslipidemia. So she presented to us with the stable angina of a three months duration at the CCS class three. Otherwise, his vital sign and clinical examinations are unremarkable and the blood investigations are all within the normal range. So the coronary angiogram performed, we show there is a severe uh, RCA at the mid segment. And the left system shows as a mild disease at the distal left main, as well as a tight osteostenosis. And there is also stenosis, a severe ISI in a proximal uh, LAD stance. Otherwise, the circumflex stance shows a mild ISR only. So what would be our strategy for this patient who has a uh, mild distal left main and severe osteo LAD? And bear in mind that there is a trifurcation or possibility of the uh, high, OM, uh, high OM artery at that time, uh, we are thinking of uh, performing this uh, provisional stenting PCR left main LAD, or what will happen if we jail this, uh, you, you impinge on the circumflex of the high OM intermediate artery, and how about the imaging guidance? So for this patient, we decide to perform the imaging guidance because there is a discrepancy of the uh, LAD as well as the left main artery size. Um, however, because there's a difficulty to advance the iris catheter, we pre dilate the lesion with the semi compliant balloon 2015 first. And this is our uh, finding after that. And there's still a very tight osteo LAD and the uh, severe ISR. So we perform our iris. And this is our iris. And uh, the right side is our uh, angiogram. So the iris shows there's a severe uh, ISR, in particular at this um, segment, at the proximal LAD, and this is a diagonal, all right, diagonal one. And I move forward a little bit faster, and you can see that at the osteo LAD, there is a very tight area and the calcifications near about 207 degree arch. And the circumflex is here, and there's also distal left main artery uh, classification and the classified nodule, which is not prominent from the angiogram. So this is a still image uh, of the angiogram and the iris image. It shows that the osteo LED at the area MLA of a 2.9 millimeter square, and the distal left main, it shows the size of the 5.0 uh, uh, size with a 12.18 millimeter square area and the plug burden of the 46%. And if the tightest point in this uh, ISR, it shows that the area of a 2.89 millimeter square. So at this point of time, what will be uh, 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 our strategy to perform? Do we still need to intervene the distal left main as the MIA area is is a very good at the 
But bear in mind that if you would like to perform the uh, DES10 of the, this uh, uh, drug, the uh, osteoid LED, you have to cross over to this uh, left main, and you may have to uh, risk of this impingement of the intermediate or the left circumflex. So how do you prepare the lesion further by using or scoring balloon, cutting balloon, attractomy, or and subsequently, what is your strategy by doing this uh, provisional stenting and what will be your their strategy? So we decide to keep the procedure simple. So we are using this uh, cutting balloon and during that time we have these uh, Wolverine balloons. We use a 3015 uh, uh, balloon, go up to a very high pressures from uh, 10 to 12 and we do several uh, pre-dilatation. So this is the finding post uh, cutting balloon the preparations. It shows a very good float. And before we decide to perform uh, this uh, drug cutter balloon, uh, we perform another iris uh, of this uh, left anterior descending artery. There is still some ISR there, but there is a cutting of this uh, ISR. And look at this uh, uh, osteoid LED. There is a, a crack of the calcium with just the cutting balloon without any dissections in the left main. And the flow is a very good to the LAD artery. And this is the minimal uh, uh, stand area, uh, MSA area of the osteo LAD at 6.38. And we decide to use this drug cutter balloon 2.75 and overlap with 3.020. And this is go a little bit to the distal left main. And this is our final result. Without any uh, flow uh, dissections at the distal left main and the T tree flow. And we perform the right coronal artery stenting with a DS 3.536. So the drug cutter balloon is the idea is has been introduced back in the 2004 with the concept of left nothing behind a uh, concept. Until the lately in the 15 years of the development, there are a lot of a study comparing the drug cutter balloon and the drug eluting stand, which shows there is a, 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 a superior result in the patient who have the ISR, but there is a mixed result compared with the uh, DES in the de novo lesions of the coronary artery. However, there is a really lack of the randomized trial to, to study the DCB at the osteo LAD alone because of the concern and the risk of the procedure uh, for this uh, 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 approach. So in our uh, center, we do have this uh, uh, drug cutter balloon uh, performed at the uh, osteo LAD for varying reason. And from our registry in the last three years, it shows that the, there is a very low maze and a variable good outcome. And the dissections after the DEB inflations was only 3.9% with 0% of the flow limiting dissections. So my discussion point showing that the distal left main bifurcation or trifurcation stenting and interventions is always complex and challenging, especially when there is a great discrepancy of the vessel size, severe calcification, and the poor heart reserve. Image guidance preparation and assessment of the vessel could help to reduce the risk and the incidence of the complications. So my conclusion is the iris guidance coronary angioplasty for distal left main bifurcation has shown a good outcome in a large randomized control trial. However, there is still lack of the randomized trials to compare to study the drug to the balloon at the de novo osteo lesions of the large coronary artery. Perhaps this approach can be used in the patient who has a contraindications to the DS or prolonged usage of the DAPT. Thank you very much. Any comment from our, sorry, any comment from our panelists? Very clear presentations. You know, you know, you know, yeah. Yeah, to, yeah, uh, you know, to deliver the drug to the coronary artery, we have to long inflation more than one minute. However, in osteal regions, so maybe the, uh, may, may improve the vital sign uh, after long impression, how do you overcome the, this phenomenon? Um, uh, during our delivery of this uh, drug to the balloon for the one minute at uh, that time, um, 
the patient does have a mild chest discomfort, but there is no uh, significant ST elevations and mm. uh, it was uh, un, un, uneventful. What is your bailout plan, Dr. Che? If there's dissection in the osteo area, then you need to stand it. Then what is your bailout plan for so this particular if, case? Uh, so if there is a dissection to this uh, distal left mean with the flow limiting, and we have to uh, uh, stand across the left mean and the LAD, and okay. with a two wire and possibly of a three wire to this uh, circumflex and the high OM or the intermediate artery and do the kissing balloon at the end if uh, needed. All right. Well, if there are no more comment, then maybe Dr. Chow can introduce our final presenter for today. Yes, the, the last one uh, we present by the, uh, Dr. Lee from Velam. The... Uh, Case is a progressive heart block of device occlusion of a simple artery septal defect. It's a uh, occluded case. So please, Dr. Lee. Uh, good afternoon, lady and gentlemen. I'm uh, very honored to join the 26 TCTAP today. I'm uh, very glad to uh, present an interesting case about a uh, progressive heart block artery device occlusion of a simple atrial septal defect. He is a uh, far east on girl. Her body weight is uh, 16 kilograms. She was diagnosed secundum SD by trans thoracic uh, echocardiography. She is um, show um, regular standard rhythm, normal AV conduction, cry deviation, um, other QRS axis, and the cry ventricle enlargement. And trans thoracic echocardiography reviews on an 18 to 20 millimeter second SD uh, with defect creams on the aortic, uh, the posterior, the pulmonary valve, the aort in atrial ventricular, the FVC, IVC, uh, were three, five, six, eight, five, and six millimeter respectively. And the interatrial septum lens were. 34 millimeter. Under catheterization, the 24 millimeter sizing balloon was used to estimate the diameter of the ASD and the stretching diameter of the ASD was 21 millimeter. We uh, decided to use a 22 ambassador set to occlude the device to blow the ASD. However, three attempts to blow the SD were failed. Uh, we changed the device was changed by a 24 millimeter fibular back to device um, to close the SD successfully. And thoracic echocardiographies uh, were done to check the device with correct position, physical to on grim, and no residual ocean. But uh, everything did, uh, didn't stop. Before releasing the device, a right to Mobis one atrial ventricular block were recorded, and it resolved after a single dose of atropine. So we decided to release the device. However, one day after implantation, the complete heart clock will appear with stable hemodynamic status. Uh, trans thoracic echocardiographies found that. The device remains fit well without compression on the chastened structure, no worsening triscopic recharge station. A two milligram per kilogram of prednisone was given daily for seven days. Unfortunately, the AV clock didn't improve, so the patient was undergone uh, open heart surgery to remove the device and close uh, the atrial um, septal defect with pericardial patch. After operation, uh, the Senate rhythm radially recovered within uh, one week. And uh, after on, the patient was discharged home. I would like to suggest um, the two discussion points. Firstly, what is the potential problem in this case? And uh, the, the other one is um, if whether we should release the device when transient heart lock happens. Okay, it's a uh, ASD uh, 
fail to use uh, occluded device and uh, finally corrected by the uh, open heart surgery, uh, solve the uh, completely block problem congratulations. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, most of the uh, congenital heart disease, uh, if done uh, interventionally, is 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 uh, uh, management managed by the uh, pediatric or cardiology too. So, uh, any question from uh, our panel panelist? Any comment? Well, uh, this uh, Doctor Chen, I think we worry about complete heart block or disability block in. Uh, closure of the VSD device most of the time, but this is an ASD device, 24 millimeter, and the length of the atrial septum is uh, 30, I, I remember correctly, 34. So it's very strange to have um, heart block in a ASD closure. And, and actually, well, of course, I think heart block is extremely a uh, worrisome complication for this very young age, five years old. For adult population, well, we can just simply implant a pacemaker for very old age patient. But a kid of five years old is, is extremely, extremely difficult to consider implantation of pacemaker, which, which I think is actually not feasible because the heart is going to grow bigger. So uh, I think a surgical option is, um, is a good option. So maybe for uh, question number two, if uh, I discover that transient heart block, which such a rare things happen in, uh, this ASD closure, then probably I will shy away from closing the device and then think uh, many times why this happened, can we avoid this? But if it's still persistent heart block, then probably I will, I will stop the procedure at that time. But it's just my humble opinion. Yes, thank you. Uh, in uh, this uh, symbol, with a symbol ASD, um, the um, the ratio of the um, complete heart block is a rare complication because the conduction system is uh, separated from the device. Uh, in this case, um, the, the patient selection collection uh, and uh, device selection is uh, very okay. Uh, the technical issue is uh, not, is not, is a, does, is a, this, this done um, encounter with uh, a significant problem during the procedure. Uh, however, um, maybe it, uh, it may be uh, um, when, off, when on off a bar were excluded, uh, the cause of maybe inflection of the device uh, to posterior and slower of the uh, IAS or the an abnormal in the conduction system. But I think this is unpredictable. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's unpredictable. Yes. So, uh, Maybe it's caused by an abnormality in the anatomical position of the uh, AV knot and uh, conduction system. Okay, uh, we will conclude the case. And uh, Dr. Chen, would you do the uh, a conclusion uh, for this section? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chow, and thank you for a panel of three uh, experts. I think uh, today we got six cases, very challenging. All right, from coronary, from structural heart, and all these uh, very difficult cases, even include chaotic complication. I think every one of us learned a lot from our international friends. I think uh, we uh, all thanks uh, the TCTAP, despite these difficult times of the pandemic, still able to arrange uh, such an educational meeting. I think all of us will learn a lot. So, uh, without further ado, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chow, and all our panelists, and also the uh, presenters for giving us all these excellent cases so that every one of us can learn a lot. I think we can see each other hopefully very soon next year. Definitely uh, no more virtual meeting next year. We can join together and then have a good chat. Okay, yes. Dr. Chow, do you have anything to add? Yeah, this Thank is you. the Chinese New Year uh, Facebook time and I <laughs> hope the pandemic will be over, will overcome uh, in this year and uh, we'll, um, we want to do a virtual meeting and next time we will meet face to face next time in uh, in Seoul and uh, thank you for the uh, for your chair and all the uh, presenter and the panelist thank you thank you thank you very much thank you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. Have a great evening